Good evening. At 6 p.m., we're going to open this meeting for a presentation on the Village Revitalization Project, which was a commission to Du Bois and King through the Economic Development Commission. And I'll introduce Sophie Sauve, who's going to make a presentation to us this evening. Um, let me open up just a little bit. First of all, thank you all for coming. Thank you for the boards for allowing this presentation to happen. Um, my name is Jody Natale. There's Beth and Lacey <laughs> and Ray Bourgeois. We comprise the C subcommittee of the Economic Development Commission. Uh, we, as a subcommittee, hired Dubois and King last year to draw up a conceptual plan of ideas that uh, could be or could not be, or depending upon everybody's opinion, um, changes that could be made, not exactly changes, but improvements that could be made to the downtown to kind of stimulate tourists, um, promote tourism to the point where people find this a designated spot that they can come back to and hopefully uh, settle here as permanent residents. So um, with that, I will now give you Sophie, who will go over the plan with you. If you have any questions, just feel free to ask anytime. Thank you, Joe. And thank you, everybody, for coming out tonight um, before the nor'easter hits us uh, yet again. Um, as you know, uh, Woodstock is a wonderful place to live in, and it's also a wonderful destination. It's been named on how many reports, travel logs, and whatnot as one of the places to come to in Vermont. And I know you're all very proud of your town and village, and that you want to keep people coming back, and as Joe mentioned, possibly settling down here to keep the village and the town alive. So what we've done is come up with some suggestions. Um, as Joe said, they're not set in stone. They're not construction documents. So we're not going to go and dig things up tomorrow. But we're, we have suggestions of improvements that could help boost Woodstock Village in terms of the structural things that are out there, um, highlight some assets that you have, promote some destinations, and, and overall add a bit of unity to the unique spots that exist within Woodstock Village. Oh, and if you have questions along the way, please feel free to ask, um, and I will try to answer them as best as I can. So just so you know, our project area is Woodstock Village, but within the boundaries that are highlighted here. So uh, from Tribu Park on the northwest end, uh, to the uh, James, or uh, James Epos, Epis, St. James, I can't pronounce it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, urban space, and then a bit further up to Pleasant Street along Elm. And we're focusing on outdoor spaces, not nothing indoor, but public. So for tonight's meeting, um, we're, I'm giving you an overview of the project, um, where we came from, where we're, we've ended at, um, and give you some suggestions in terms of what could, could possibly be next. But hopefully you'll have some ideas of what you want to go and do as soon as spring hits in terms of the implementation ideas that are there. Because we really wanted to give you things that are, as we call, the low-hanging fruit that could be done in the next year um, versus a bunch of suggestions that will take five, ten years to do. But of course there are those sprinkled in, in, in between. So first, when we do studies like this, we go out and we want to get to know the village or uh, town or village in this case, because I'm not a resident of a Woodstock. I don't know all the nuts and bolts. So I rely upon what I observe when I first come to a place, but also on historical information and um, seeing the um, village kind of acti be activated through different means and also the different seasons, of course here in Vermont. 
So uh, one of the things we did was um, document some of the assets of, of Woodstock. These are by no means um, exhaustive. But for example, you have the middle covered bridge, you have the green, obviously. You have all these little um, unique things like the town crier that does not exist in other um, cities or towns that need to be really um, preserved, but also highlighted as part of a revital revitalization plan. And then, of course, on the flip side, there are opportunities of where things could be improved. For example, there's a super long crosswalk um, near the elementary school and Central or South Park Street. Um, you have a kind of a blank facade wall on Mechanic Street leading towards the visitor center that could use a bit of spicing up because there aren't any eyes on that um, space and it's kind of dark. It's not something that's welcoming to go through and towards the a welcome center. Um, you have also uh, at Elman Central Street uh, what some refer to as a dummy in the middle of the um, triangle, which is kind of the crux of the village. So it's where everybody kind of gets a first impression when they're really in Woodstock. So how can that be improved? And then um, other things like accessibility in terms of um, there are steps that are inaccessible to, to some people. Um, there are also, in terms of how do we find our way around Woodstock Village and how do we know what's beyond if we're interested in Mount Tom, for example, how do I get there? And also just looking at the green spaces, there are so many of them, but a lot of focus is on the green uh, because it is in the middle. Uh, but what about the other ones and do they need a little bit of attention? And then, of course, um, another aspect that was part of our um, mandate was to look at the different amenities or street furniture that exists within Woodstock. And there's quite a collection uh, from uh, quite a few benches. This is not exhaustive either. Um, there's picnic tables, there's different bike racks, lighting fixtures, and then um, trash and recycling receptacles. And I know that it's hard for everybody to agree on, uh, for example, one thing in a town, but what we're suggesting, and we'll talk about later, is that perhaps having a pallet um, that open spaces or public spaces could use in the future when replacing things um, would help uh, kind of connect the village parts together, rather than having kind of a mishmash of everything. While we're not saying that we should make everything cookie cutter by any means, um, it's, it's just about having a design language and kind of um, spreading it throughout to connect things. So um, throughout the process, we had a few opportunities for public engagement. The main one was uh, June 6th um, when we were at the farmer's market tabling for several hours. And then afterwards, we also were um, in a currently vacant space um, on Central Avenue, where we invited business owners and the general public to come in and tell us, what do you love about Woodstock? What do you have problems with? And um, what do you see as a vision for the future? Not by, by any means was it an exhaustive discussion, but we tried to fo get people to focus on the physical aspects that we could actually address. This is just kind of an overview of what that feedback was like. Um, for example, some were um, for a continuity of having matching street furniture, some are not. Um, some are, uh, believe there's already too much signage in the, in the village, whereas for wayfinding, we need to look at different ways that we can also use signs and cues to direct people to different parts that aren't familiar with Woodstock Village. And then um, universal access was also an issue or a, a concern. And um, encouraging public transportation was another one. And of course, there were discussions on the side of things that we can't necessarily address as part of the physical environment, but that were noted in a memo, memo that's available as part of this study, so that it is um, available to the town to look at when they're considering other subjects. So from Existing condition studies and then the public engagement piece, uh, we looked at um, developing a vision for the rest of the project. 
which includes just looking at opportunities for pedestrian improvement because really if you want people to come to your town and walk around, that's where a lot of the gain will be from an economic standpoint for businesses and whatnot. Usually people don't spend as much money if they're in their cars unless they get out of their cars. Same thing for cyclists. Cyclists tend to spend more money than people in vehicles, etc. So we really wanted to look at what are the little uh, nits and gritty things that um, could be weary to pedestrians um, getting around and what can we do to kind of enhance the experience because for example in terms of finding your way around if you get to a place and you're not looking at your phone and you want to find your uh, way intuitively around this space how do you do that if there aren't enough cues or if there aren't enough signs um, because uh, if you can't keep moving so to speak then the, f the fact that you need to hesitate will make your um, journey less enjoyable. But not to the point of putting a sign every five steps, obviously, but how do you do that in a mild way that can help um, people feel welcome, essentially? So from there, um, there were three kind of categories of design that we dove further into. Um, the three kind of big headings were gateway and wayfinding, accessibility and safety, and land use and design. And while um, there are sub or ideas under each of those, they kind of all blend together at some point because it's not all, everything's not static. And I'll try to refer to that throughout the rest of the presentation. Are there any questions so far? I was too about to ask that, no questions yet. Anybody? Oh, okay. This could be good or bad. <laughs> so f first focusing on gateway and wayfinding. While this is not an exhaustive wayfinding plan, uh, we've identified some areas where either there are already opportunities to add more information or where it would be vital to provide more information. Yes. Can we just point out there are copies of this to, for you to have here? Yes, in the front if you're interested. All right, so just to go over the big topics in this plan, for example, over here at the American Legion Courtyard, um, it would be beneficial if there was some kind of information located there to talk about the courtyard. How did it come about? Why is it there? Although it may be obvious to all of us, it may not to someone who's from out of the country, for example, or out of state. Um, and also, to can, you can see this little icon, it looks like a trail marker, is on all the green, what I call the green jewels throughout Woodstock vi excuse me, Village, um, because it would be great to connect those to each other as well, because they are there, and they pro I imagine what I've observed anyhow, they're under, some of them are underused. So how can we kind of boost their visibility, but also boost their use? And then on the other side, um, for example, the town crier, it's an analog, uh, obviously, information <coughs> station. But what about if we added a QR code for the millennials out there who can't live without having the constant feedback and update? It doesn't have to be um, a huge code. It can be pretty discreet. And that's just an idea that can be added to other situations as well. And then um, I know uh, the an information booth um, on the green is also contested, but the, it's an opportunity to have a map for those who come off of a bus um, during bus tour or leaf season, leaf peeping season, to see a map to orient themselves immediately to the town and the village. And then these little markers are just ideas of where pedestrian um, wayfinding could be situated around the village in terms of um, confirming that you're going in the right direction and then also pointing to um, the context in terms of oh if you have an extra 15 minutes why not go to the trailhead um, to more to the north for example could you explain that because I don't understand what you just said okay uh, completely I'm new I'm new in town and I'm, yep. there's a little sign there sure with just a, an icon on it and that's going to Tell me. No, I'll, I'm going to go into okay. detail in a minute. And right. I'll, I'll All explain right. it better. All right, thank you. Yeah. So I'll keep going just so we can get to those ideas. So back to the um, gateway, for example, at Central and Elm Street, uh, which currently is kind of lost 
um, with the different color buildings and traffic and everything else when you're first coming into town. Um, what about bringing back the fountain, for example, and adding some color and flowers to kind of give it a little bit of punch? And this is just a quick idea. It's nothing that's been vetted or anything like that. It could be something bigger. It could The plantings could be totally different. But what about giving it a bit more oomph is um, the idea. And then as I referred to the information um, station in the green, for example, which currently is kind of distracting in terms of um, <coughs> giving, uh, does not match to me the concept or the idea of what Woodstock Village is about in terms of being uh, higher end, I would say. Oops, excuse me. So again, just a quick idea, clean it up, have a map there for those of us who don't always rely on our phones for map finding. Tell people where they are and then add some um, plantings, for example. Oh, there's a question? Just, just a question, I'm sorry. Sure. Um, I'm just, is this project all about signage? When I think of revitalization, I think of like making the tennis courts in Dale Field, you know, improve them, sure. and making Dale Field more in inviting to young families that come here. Okay, so better to, get to and, that. And I probably am a little behind, but it seems to me this is really, this project is really just about signage. Not yet, now, we're gonna get to it. This is just one of the three big categories okay. and really it's not just about signage but it's about gateway and entry into the town and making people feel welcome and sort of feel like I've arrived so it's really a combination of, of different tools that can indicate that not not solely about throwing up a bunch of signs okay. yeah yes I think this is very attractive but I have one question there are very few ways for community organizations to present whatever activity they have in this village and they're getting to be fewer and fewer. Is there any replacement for that? That's a good question. It's not something that I've looked into. I think it's important. Yes, I, I, think, I, I agree. think you're right. And I think that, um, that can be addressed in coordination with the chamber. Just, just a suggestion. I, oh, I think it's a great idea, and no, I think you're right. It's, it's valuable information, <laughs> but again, uh, it doesn't mean that this has to exclude that. It could be more no, no, like a spot. No, it's very attractive, and I think I, yeah. I see what she's saying. It doesn't really, you know, yeah. help, but we do Completely. need that too. Sure. Is all sure. I'm, sure. All, all I was asking was, did your plan actually address that? But no, it doesn't, and no. it can be addressed elsewhere. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, and, and I would say in other towns um, in Vermont. Throwing up a banner on the light post for whatever is happening. It could be, it could be movies, it could be GMHA. This time we are very restrictive, and it's not that I'm not going to blame Michael Brands. He's just doing his job. But if we're serious about promoting what's going on in the village, then we should have the ability to put up the banners and not have like a seven-day requirement on the green and no ability to use the light posts. Um, there are so many towns you can go into and it says, you know, this is what we're doing. It's economic development. It's, it's telling people, projecting what it is that we have to offer. And it could be what we have to offer Pente, it could be Jimmy Che, it could be any of us. Well, if, if I might put back a little bit, uh, um, it's, it's been my experience, so I've seen that there have been uh, notices, banners, and on those tall, tall poles in front of the green that announce things like Special Olympics and other events that are coming into town. Uh, there have been banners that have stretched right across Central Street announcing that there's a, uh, a, a World Cup ski match going on up at Killington. So that does happen. Now, maybe not to the extent that we're happy with, but uh, it, it does happen. <coughs> and you're right, there has to be a certain kind of protocol because uh, one of the things that makes this place charming I think, is that we don't have a lot of sparkles and banners and all that I, stuff I that's going on. I would just push back and say that Hanover and Hampshire is, is you know, the home of Dartmouth, and they managed to make it very tasteful mm -hmm. on the lights to say, this is what's going on in the hop, or this is, and, and we have gotten to a point where nothing is really possible. So if we're talking about signage, <coughs> let's promote what we have to promote. And, 
you know, get over those restrictions. I don't think it's going to be tacky if it's well done. And I think in Burlington, one of the ways they address it is they actually have a board just for postings like this so that they are in a designated place. But I think if you have a spot where people are coming off the bus and they need to know where they're going, that should maybe take not necessarily precedence, but where the location of that spot is for information about community events should maybe be rethought in, in that same thing. That implies that the, the green is for tourists and not for the residents. Not necessarily, because I don't think, I don't know if everybody knows where everything is from a spatial point of view in terms of a map, for example. And I mean, there is also, there are also posters on the opposite side of the information area. Isn't that correct? So that, that could act as a diff, another, like a fl the flip side of it. You're talking about removing all those little things that people, because people can't like necessarily get a banner made if sure. they're just going to have a meeting. But the other side of the building also has posters. The other side of the building. I would suggest that we let her move along so we can yeah. move questions more toward the end. So as previously mentioned, another um, spot where uh, revitalization could occur is a man mechanic street, excuse me, le leading towards the visitors or the welcome center. Um, there's, uh, because it's a very narrow alleyway or was an alleyway, um, it's difficult as a pedestrian to feel like they have the space there. So a suggestion, for example, not that we need a yellow brick road, this is just kind of a play on it. But what about something leading towards the welcome center so that people actually know where it is? And then using the blank brick wall as an art space um, to kind of uplift it and also be an attraction in that direction. And then this is just a view in the other direction. Right now, the welcome center sign is very small. It's difficult to um, ascertain that that's where you have to go if you are coming into town. and. Um, so making it a little bit bigger would be helpful for pedestrians and for those who don't necessarily have 40-40 uh, vision um, and are try trying to navigate a new place. And of course we can use, um, here's just the use of uh, one of the photographs from the History Center to highlight um, Woodstock's history. And then back to the town crier, as previously mentioned, uh, adding in a very discreet QR code, for example, that links to the Woodstock website or uh, upcoming events or anything um, possible related to Woodstock. And then subtly uh, just giving a touch of paint and then fixing the sign that says who's maintaining the town crier would be a great thing to do. And then, so in terms of um, wayfinding, as I mentioned, this is not a concrete plan, it's just suggestions, and it's a matter of determining what would work for Woodstock, because as I mentioned, some um, of the feedback we heard during the public outreach event was already too many signs. So is it being uh, more discreet in terms of an interpretive sign, or for example, Windsor has larger panels with some historical information and an itty bitty little QR code that leads to an audio tour of the, the town so that if you want the added level of history, you are able to do that. And same thing, this is more of an artful approach to a hist historical tour, for example. And then you have Middlebury that has signs saying you're in the village center. Um, then there are other types of signage, um, street signs that have like you're in a certain neighborhood. For example, Woodstock Village, if it wanted to be distinguished in that way, that would be one approach. And we do have um, one sign at Tribu Park that um, alludes to this, but it's difficult to read. Um, and it's only located at the tip of it, so you'd have to actually walk up to it to see it. So the second kind of big um, column we had was safety and accessibility. So moving away from signage, but of course wayfinding is also part of accessibility. Your town or your village cannot be accessible if people can't read it, and that's on several levels. Um, so part of that, we did a sidewalk study that looked at um, the sidewalks within the village to see in terms of accessibility, um, what, what sidewalks meet accessibility, which ones do not. 
and uh, we elaborate upon that in um, the final report we'll be delivering to the committee. But overall, it's to look at sidewalks in terms of five feet is the minimum to meet uh, accessibility standards in across the United States. There are sidewalks within the village that do not meet that. In some cases, it's difficult to imagine expanding them because there are, say, a fence on one side and a tree on the other. There are um, grandfathering rules um, at the state level for those, but in areas um, where that happens, there are, there are requirements in terms of how long you can have a sidewalk that is not five feet. Because at some point, for example, two people who are in wheelchairs would have to pass each other, similar to ramp situation. And then, of course, I'm sure everybody has experienced the heaving and cracks from tree roots on their sidewalks. And I know there are several potholes in the road, but we're focusing on um, the sidewalk portion. And I'm sure things are, have not gotten better after this winter because it's been very harsh throughout the state. Um, and then in situations where there's um, crosswalks, each crosswalk is required to have a truncated dome, which is those little bumps. Uh, to announce that there's a, you're approaching a road, and in some cases those are missing from crosswalks. And uh, in, the, in the next in two years, there'll be a, a, a paving project in the town where hopefully some of these issues can be addressed, but in a lot of cases it, it, they need to be uh, at least discussed um, s sooner than later. So other little things um, that could be addressed, especially as part of a paving project, um, is for example, I'm sure everybody's parked along the green and uh, a, lot of a lot of, you can see a lot of cars are not located right next to the curb because of the lack of space of opening your door and being able to get out, putting your money in the parking meter, for example. And I'm not sure who needs to maintain this part that's constantly eroding, but it would be recommended to either move the uh, curb and add um, enough space for people to walk along there safely because this is not a safe situation, but then um, remove the grass and put in a pavers or some other hard surface so that um, it doesn't look like this. And it also is not difficult for the maintenance crews to address. And then, um, again, as part of VTrans' paving project, it would be good for them to look at how they striped parking along the green. If you're walking on this access, this is a legal parking spot. Um, it doesn't tell me that I can really get out of the park. And also, if you're, you have any disability whatsoever, have gotten out of your car and you're trying to get into the green, this becomes super challenging. <coughs> and it really is about the access that are established within the park in terms of visibility too. This is a beautiful building and it's obstructed in part because of the parking. And then as I mentioned, part of the sidewalk study, um, there's also utility cover downtown that's um, slumped in. That's a major um, issue in terms of access and it's, it's just dangerous for everybody. Um, this is where the truncated dome is missing even if it has a nice crosswalk. And then, of course, there are, um, there's sidewalks that are um, in asphalt, which is not a problem overall, but um, then there's this huge gap that's formed between the concrete and the asphalt, which could be problematic. And then, of course, there are challenges that are known um, in terms of access, ac accessing businesses when there are stairs involved in the front. Um, some of those um, challenges have been resolved by having a, a different entrance for accessibility, but um, looking at that as a town-wide um, challenge is, is ideal. For example, um, on, uh, on Elm Street, there, because there's diagonal parking and there are very wide travel lanes, it's possible to imagine that we could change this to parallel parking, regain some sidewalk area, and then uh, provide several businesses together with a ramp. Um, which makes for an elevated sidewalk and then a lower sidewalk. Which Although I think that that could be a nice idea, we are already highly limited on parking here. The amount of spaces that we would lose in the central district would be horrendous for that. Thank you. And it would, having people try to parallel park would be a nightmare. 
You know, Gary, I, I completely agree with you. But this is just I Oh, guess. I understand. I'm talking <coughs> just about that one thing. <coughs> I think it would be worthwhile from the perspective of the diagonal parking too to look um, to do a um, kind of turning radius and all that situation because there are traffic um, accidents because of the uh, visibility issues in backing up into the travel way too, especially around a bend. I just think we don't have many of those, but I guess it's something to think about. Yeah. So just an example of how this has been done. Mind you, they had more a space to work with in their travel way. Um, it, this is in Virgin where they uh, did a ramp situation hitting several of the businesses and then they have a lower um, sidewalk which is at the uh, typical grade. Is that legal? I mean do we have to do that? Is that something that has to be done? No, but um, it's not something that has to be done, but when each business does an upgrade, they are required to figure out um, how accessibility works into um, upgrading their building. So it's something that everybody, or all businesses that are affected by this would benefit from looking at together. Because I think in terms of every business looking at it separately because they're small um, storefronts or um, buildings essentially in terms of width, that adding an, a ramp to every single one in the front would never work because of the spatial issues. But that if everybody worked together, um, it is a possibility. And then um, there are areas where the crosswalks, uh, the visibility is challenged when you um, step off of the sidewalk because of the parked cars and there's already paint demarcating, there's no parking. So that's space that could be taken back up in terms of becoming more part of the public um, realm. And you have, these are just different views of the same crosswalk, but um, having to kind of tell motorists to stop because you're trying to cross is um, just identifies the challenge, especially in the evening. I didn't understand that part. Can you, say that? Can you go through that again? This part? So when you when you're at this crosswalk, which is in front of Gilli Gilliam, sorry, Gilliam, thank you. More parking spaces? No, um, this is a no parking zone already. It's already painted out as no parking, so it's an opportunity to have a, what we call a curb extension, so that you're protected on both sides by a barrier, essentially, when you until you walk up into into the travel way. So because of the visibility, you see the park cars on this side and there's park cars also on this side. Nobody can see you when you step into the road here, which is technically the crosswalk, up until you get to this point. So what I'm suggesting is a curb extension, which means the curb would follow this just like it is right now. And you gain that much space back from the public realm to make, do something else with it. And at the same time, improve safety at the crosswalk. You could also improve the aesthetics of that area by using that space with plants and, and seating, maybe even a table and, 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 and things like that that would be more useful than just white lines on the road. Right. So exactly what Joe imagined. I drew it right now. <laughs> so it could be elevated. It could I'm be at the... i because we already have one little small bump out and it's right. a problem for plowing in the winter. Right. It, it, they are more challenging for plowing if they're elevated. Um, however, they are uh, more, a lot more safe for pedestrians. So this is just showing it at grade as a quick example, but this is how far we go out, which gains quite a bit of space in front of, um, on this side of the road anyhow. And then you can, like Joe was saying, add a bench, add tables, add planters, beautify. And also at this juncture, you're just about to arrive at the core of the village. So it's kind of announcing you are almost there. Plus it slows down traffic when there's a curb extensions because of, uh, when you're a motorist, you feel that crunching in into the travel way. Excuse me, is that like right in front of the bank? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So in terms of land use and design, which is our third kind of bucket, um, there are several things to look at, which also go back into the other two. It's just inevitable because we don't just do one thing for one purpose. 
So for example, um, along Central Street, there are trees that are planted there. They're in um, different states of um, happiness, one would say, um, which is in part because their, their, their soil is being trampled. They have very little space for their roots to grow. Eventually, they'll probably cause the sidewalk to heave because the roots are looking for somewhere to go. Um, but there are um, solutions to that both in the short term and in the future when planting trees. For example, adding in tree grates, which I'm sure you've seen in other situations, um, will help protect that part of the um, tree that's um, at the root zone, essentially. And then um, some towns are adding in what's called structural <coughs> soil to existing plantings and also in future plantings. And what that does is it's a so special soil that's been um, composed in a lab um, to allow tree roots to have, or the soil has space in between um, that is created by the, com the com kind of chemical reaction of the soil so that there are pores essentially so that the tree roots have space to go. And instead of going up towards your sidewalk or your road, they're actually happy and finding their way within the structural soil. So if you can say something. Yes. Uh, maybe I, I should have said this in the beginning, probably. Um, I'm, sh I'm sure that all, all of us that live here walk around and we think about, wouldn't it be nice if this was done? Wouldn't it be that if this was done? We live in a beautiful community. And this is an attempt to accentuate the beauty that does exist in the village for different reasons. One, uh, we have challenges in the community. We have business challenges <coughs> where certain times of the year there isn't any. Um, and other times of the year it's good, always could be better. We have population challenges. <coughs> Our school population is diminishing rapidly. How can we get people to live here permanently? What this is, and Sophie, Sophie's doing a, a great job at this, was an attempt by the subcommittee of the EDC to pull some of these ideas together and pull them together towards the goals of accentuating the beauties we have in town to attract people to come here more often and hopefully live here. Um, so there's going to be stuff that, that's going to come up here and probably will never come to fruition. But there are ideas. And it hopefully will stimulate more <laughs> ideas and other ideas. And at some point, we can pull these ideas together and, uh, and make it work. So that's what this is all about. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, so next slide. Oops. And then, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, one of the things we looked at was uh, unifying street furniture, for example. And street furniture is not inexpensive. Trash cans are expensive. And so when you choose to make that kind of investment, you really want to find the best place to put things. So, for example, looking at where this bench is located and then sitting on the bench and seeing what you're seeing from the bench, <laughs> may want may yeah. make you think maybe that bench can have a better life somewhere else <laughs> so there are these little things that are simple but you don't think of because you walk by it and you think well it's still a bench and it's a great amenity which one cannot um, contest but when you buy and you invest those things just make sure they're in the right location <laughs> So in terms of the green, um, there has been a study in the 90s about the health of the trees, not just in the green, but along Route 4, which I'm not sure to what extent has been applied, but there are several trees, for example, down here in the green that no longer exist. It would be beneficial to go back to this study, see if things have changed, and then um, replant as one would say, especially in the green where there are trees that are maturing, eventually they will decline. So how can we make sure that the, the green is maintained the way that everybody loves and feels about it? 
um, and the trees would be one of the primary things. You can change all the furniture you want in there, but at the end of the day, if the trees are all dead, then the green just won't be the same. And then um, another issue we talked about was um, parking meters, which I've heard are, have been challenging because of the solar power issue. And so if, it's a, if there is a time to reevaluate when what happens to the parking meters when um, the lease expires, from what I understand. The year, I think, Jeff? There's no lease. Oh. No, there is. It was a three-year contract. Well, yeah, but it's a over. A contract. Well, it's over. No, it's no. Not. Well, three years. For a year and a half. And we only started it last year. Well, okay. No, it's well, more than it's two years. Ago. So when when there's an opportunity to um, rethink about the parking meters, for example, maybe thinking about uh, replacing them with a kiosk, in, so that when there are issues like snow plowing, <coughs> there isn't another obstacle in the way of snow plowing, for example. And it's all in one location. And also, some of the more sophisticated machines nowadays, um, which are beyond my uh, reach, um, also allow, for example, merchants to have a code to give to a customer to validate tickets so that you can help um, the businesses sort of promote uh, shopping locally um, through that mean of parking. And this is an example of their use. Um, this is in Winooski, just above from the ginormous roundabout. Um, so there's on-street parking and there's a meter just at the corner with other um, signage that's there. So if you think about it just from a snow plowing perspective, there's already stuff there so you can go around it and it's easy enough to access. And this is another one in, in Ottawa just to give you a closer <coughs> up perspective of them. <coughs> If you think about it, you probably make more money. Yeah, you make more money because if somebody leaves the parking space, that's right. That's right. It goes to zero. Because people go up and down looking for green light to flash. <laughs> yeah. There's no green light to flash. And you usually have to put in your license plate number so that you can't give you're someone else your ticket. You know your license plate number. <laughs> <laughs> Which, from a driver perspective, <laughs> not necessary. No. <laughs> So um, another thing we looked at was um, there are several bike route signs in, within the village pointing outwards, but what about bicycling inside the village um, boundaries? Uh, this is the part of the signage, but, and then we have accommodations for cyclists, but there are cyclists um, having to travel with traffic, which leaves quite a few number of um, non-confident riders out of the picture because they won't ride with traffic or they're riding on the sidewalk and that's a whole other safety um, issue. So looking at connecting those bike routes within the village would bring cyclists downtown, providing them with the amenities to park um, uh, with fixed parking, also gives them the safety um, feeling so that they can go and spend their money downtown and just enjoy the village in general. Um, so, sorry, this is suggested connection to the bike routes. Um, a benefit could be that there's so many cyclists, um, uh, there's tours coming to Woodstock Village, for example. And then just uh, looking at how bike lanes have been integrated um, nearby in Burlington. And then these are not um, what we've uh, selected by any means, but it's just something something to think about again in terms of street furniture, in terms of uniting the different um, open spaces and public spaces within Woodstock, and just having that kind of pattern language. Not ready for any of these changes? It's okay. We have stepping stones. For example, um, trying out temporary bike lanes is possible with just some paint, um, some cones, and a lot of volunteers. Um, this happens, has happened a lot more frequently throughout Vermont as Locomotion, the um, bike um, advocacy group out of Burlington, has, now has a trailer full of tools that they can lend or rent, I believe, to towns to try these things out. And they have all the, diff like the stencil, for example, so you're not having to look for these very far. And then in Burlington, um, to, to kind of do a quick, what is called a quick build, um, they use paint and some bollards and planters to establish a curb extension to try things out again 
and to see, uh, get feedback from the public instead of investing a gazillion dollars and then figuring out it's not what, what the town or the village wanted. And I'm sure you've seen Bethel nearby where they've um, used integrated art within um, the community to help um, revitalize it. If you haven't, take a drive north. And then um, if you went through Bethel this past summer, they had kind of this step after trying out the paint, um, they did rubber bump outs, which were temporary. So they installed these for the summer. They're completely removable. They're not there now. Um, and um, then they're garnering feedback to see if this is what they will do as a next step. And then in terms back to signs, um, just in terms of figuring out what, um, what location signs should be in, whether they're um, signs per se or something on the ground or, or other cues. Um, Walk, My, Walk Your City is a, a, a company that you basically <coughs> enter all the locations you feel should have signs. They make the signs for you for a fee and then you, ins you volunteers install them and you see the QR code is on there for um, those who want to check in that way. And then you evaluate their usage. So again, it's something you can install temporarily and then move around um, and give information at the same time. So the big question, where's the money going to come from? <laughs> it's always the, the kind of um, elephant in the room. Well, there are several funding sources available throughout the state um, for parts or a lot of components of the different suggestions we're making here. For example, right now, Woodstock Village is uh, designated as a village, so there are benefits to that in terms of seeking grant and other assistance from the state. But another step from that is a downtown designation, which opens up a different pot of funding called the Downtown Transportation Fund, where a lot more money and a lot more grant assistance and loan assistance is available. And that would be a discussion to have with a state representative who can speak better to that. But from what um, exam case studies we've seen, for example, uh, St. Albans took advantage of several of these pots of money at once and were able to really transform their downtown where the um, payback has been uh, I, I don't know the numbers, but very, very good. For example, they have a new hotel that went up based on streetscape enhancements and revitalization that have been successful. Also, the American Association of Retired Persons, which you would not think of for a grant source uh, for this type of project, um, they have training and technical assistance for um, pop-ups that we saw, um, for example, in Bethel, that was um, part of the funding came from the AARP. They also offer training on how to, how to kind of lead one of the pop-ups, and then they have um, funding. Um, VTrans, as I mentioned, there's a paving project coming up, so it's an opportunity to talk to VTrans at this point in time before they do their construction documents to say, when you put the striping around the green, please make sure that these access points are available. When you're looking at crosswalks, we don't want the red paint, we want zebra crossings or something else that will last longer, for example. Um, so really it's now, now is the time for the town to talk to VTrans about the paving projects so that they can consider them early on in their um, developing the construction documents and then they can go on and install these things. Uh, VTrans also has uh, bicycle and pedestrian studies um, that are funded. Uh, I believe it's 50-50 match for a kind of um, scoping study and then there's a different match for uh, implementation where, for example, crosswalk um, curb extensions could be considered or lighting, different, different um, things. The Vermont Arts Council has an animating infrastructure grant program that allows art to be integrated into, as it says, animating space, which could really be beneficial in terms of um, highlighting some of the art community here in Woodstock. And then the Vermont Community Foundation has several grant programs available that could, could be tapped into. And not to think of these as just one source, but 
using them creatively and as a combination of sources is really <laughs> the way to go. And that's how St. Albans successfully tapped um, a lot of the resources that are at the state level. And that's all I have. So if anyone has any questions, please. Away. Yes. Thank you, Sophie. <laughs> Before the questions begin, I'd like oh. to say thank you. Jason, you got a question? I have a question. Just a comment about the name. To Alita's point, Village Revitalization Project. And I saw in one place it says Village Streetscape oh, sorry. Revitalization. And I think that's an important distinction because I think that is much too broad to Alita's point. It doesn't address critical things with our parks, for example. Like Teagle Landing is falling apart. Uh, and, you know, this is super important, really important, but there are also some more base, more fundamental aspects of village revitalization. Okay. But I would just, you know, village revitalization has a lot more components that sure. are reflected in yes. this, so I keep it the streetscape. Well, in Tigo Landing, I do address in the report. Okay. I just couldn't cover everything. In Mailfield as well? So no, because that's out, out of the project area scope. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes? I really appreciated uh, the ideas that have to do with making this uh, village more walkable uh, and accessible welcoming to people that are on foot. I believe that that's good for us as residents. I believe that's good for people that are visiting. And I also think those are steps that in the future, uh, you know, as we look ahead to what will Woodstock be and what will be its attraction, I really think that um, being a place that people can be on foot and cars less of the uh, priority is really, um, I value that, so I appreciate that. <laughs> So you mentioned bicycles. You know, the inn gives out bikes for their residents, uh, their guests to, to ride, and it seems like it's not that safe. And, and how would you be able to fit uh, bicycle on <coughs> Central Street? It's very narrow. So at Central Street would be challenging without looking at removing parking, which I'm not saying we're removing parking, but. Um, Around the green, for example, the travelways are super wide, and there's definitely an opportunity for bike lanes there. Whereas Central Street in the interim, you'd be looking probably at Sharrows, just to at least say that bikes are welcome here and they have as much right as a, a vehicle. But it by no means would be super safe. Yeah. Yes. Two things. Um, first of all, I think, as she said, you know, making it more walkable, having more. Um, making it more welcoming, this is all very, very important. However, one of the reasons people like Woodstock is because it doesn't look like everywhere else. Mm -hmm. And the kind of signage you're, you're, you're proposing is going to make it kind of look like Newburyport or Rockport or any of those places down country. And I think that it would be very, very important <coughs> To, to create signage that was unique to Woodstock and didn't have great big blue peas for parking. I mean, obviously, there's some of that you have to do for people from other countries. But um, I think it's really important to maintain the uniqueness and to maintain the um, character of this village. This village, um, we've worked really hard over the years. I don't actually live in Woodstock, but I am, I, I have two businesses. Um, we've worked for many, many, many years to make sure that we don't have chain stores, that we don't have, that we don't wind up looking like a strip mall. And to put in that kind of signage is right on the edge. So I think it's really important to address that very individually and maybe come up with, um, creative people within the community who, admittedly, you don't live here, you don't necessarily know these things, but there are people within this community who are extremely creative and could be tapped to handle some of that and to do a really great job for you. Um, that was one thing. The other thing is everybody's, you know, you can see the, the hot button that parking is. Parking is just a, an atrocious, okay? 
Um, it's been changed, I don't know how many times in my lifetime. I mean, I've, I've been, <laughs> never mind. Anyway, point is, at some point, <coughs> and that point is fast approaching, we have to come up with a permanent solution. And the permanent solution is not going to be just changing the parking spaces. We are going to have to have some kind of either a parking structure or a parking lot or something and some kind of transportation within the village because while it would be lovely to think that everybody's going to walk the village, fact is that we need, to we need to attract the older people who don't necessarily walk all that easily. <laughs> we need to attract, um, as we've all uh, addressed, uh, people with varying abilities. We need to attract all groups of people to make it a vital community. And that's not going to happen with the parking situation the way it is. I don't, I believe we don't want to focus on vehicles, like you said. Let's focus on you know, all of that, but we have to come up with a permanent solution. Okay. Laura, Laura thank, thank you, you for your comment. Um, what happens, I think, from my experience, and I've been living here almost 30 years. Mm -hmm. right? I've been here longer. <laughs> and um, from my experience, people who come into Woodstock very often do not know. There's a lot of energy and a lot of hard work going into the east end of town. Sustainable Woodstock is doing a great job with revitalizing and attempting <coughs> that. You know, people who come in town, they don't, don't, they don't know what's going on. Nobody knows what's going on. Though. Well, they should. That's they the should. point. But nobody does. But they will <laughs> get a sign that tells them that. Sure. That's the sure. point. But I think it needs and to then there's there's there are people that don't know how that they can walk, which some people, and they come to the cafe, and they say, where can we go? And I say, Billings Farm, can we walk there? Sure you can. Well, how do you get there? I don't know, you know, what, what's the direction? So we have to direct it. Totally Signage agree. would help that. So totally we, there are people who <coughs> are physically unable to do all the things that can be done in town. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of people who aren't. I know, and, and all I'm saying and about the we have signages to address is, them all. all I'm saying about the signage is you've got a, a, an enormous base of creative people in this area. Rather than having generic signage that looks just like all the other tourist towns all over New England, how about coming up with signage which is unique to Woodstock? Well, I think that these are suggestions that have worked in other places, and they're just oh, that, think. suggestions. And, and this is just a suggestion. And we need to decide what will work best for mm -hmm. us. Absolutely. Carrie? I must say I came in skeptical, but I'm not going to leave that way. I think that a mm -hmm. lot of the things that have happened here are obviously a very difficult challenge for our village but i want to thank everybody for the time that was done to spend this because you actually obviously you put in the time that Absolutely. was worth it to really see what was going on in it during our busiest time of year and even later i mean the the detail hmm. of the photographs and but i think that some of the ideas can really actually work for us right really that that alleyway for the um mm. for where the welcome center that's is that's i've been possible. saying that those brick <coughs> walls need something they're dead they're dreary i mean you think you're walking to where there's going to be dumpsters but it's actually a beautiful <laughs> yes. welcome center <laughs> well that said. us as taxpayers paid a lot of money and are still paying money to maintain mm -hmm. i think you did a great job so you guys should all everybody involved should be applauded for this thank you absolutely thank you. i appreciate it <laughs> just, just one comment, and the signage, the QR is absolutely needed, mm -hmm. okay, because if we want to attract younger people here, they'll feel not that they're walking, they may be walking back in time, <laughs> yes. or looking at things that are older, but they're still walking ahead in time, and that is something that we need for anybody, you know, from 10 on, is going to be using that. If they see it, they'll think, oh, Okay, this place is at least hip going forward. <laughs> I was going to use him. But yeah. 10 so, 50. Yeah, yeah. Yes. No, but it's really an important piece for any sign that goes up. And you can get a lot of history from it, you can get a lot of information <coughs> from it, and you can get a lot of direction from there's, it. There's there. so many beautiful places in town that people come to town and never, they never know anything about it. I they agree. come to town, they grab a bite to eat, fill up their car with gas, <coughs> not know what a beautiful bridge there is on the other end of Elm Street, or how to, how to get to Billings Farm from the center of town. Personally, I think we've got a communication problem in this town. Well, 
I mean, we'll get people to that later. don't know. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I mean, this <laughs> kind of communication problem. I'm not talking about that kind Rich of Rich has a question, Joe. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I was curious. You would. The, uh, the Virgen's uh, mm -hmm. sidewalk thing. How did, um, do you know what that cost? How, uh, how did they fund it? Was it something that was done with the town and the property owners? Did the property owners take care of it themselves? Do you I believe it was a combination of state funding. Um, so some of the pots that I was talking about um, that funded first a conceptual and um, a study basically to start off with. And from there, um, they went after another pot of money. They were designated downtown, and I know that that's how some of it came to be. Because right. we looked at it when we were studying accessibility five years ago for the town of Woodstock. I don't know the, the dollar amount, but I could find out if you would like to know. Thank you. Yes? Uh, I just want to um, share the concern about uniformity and in, in wayfinding and street furniture, um, it tends to look pretty generic. And even the, the public art can look pretty generic yeah. if you're not using actual artists, but kind of sign makers. Um, you know, that, that fish in Bethel is cute, but it was obviously made by a, a commercial sign maker. Um, no, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. No, no, it looks like it was. People getting it was together to make it look the way it does, and it looks amazing. Bethel's got a really vital group right now. It's all community coming together in Bethel. And there were volunteers assembling it and everything. So, all right, so putting aside the fish in Bethel, <laughs> um, there just the concern would be to, I'm obviously the fixing the, the streets and making them welcoming to people who walk on them either every day or because they're visiting um, and making sure that the wayfinding makes sense. Um, it's just, I would agree that that kind of putting up the same old commercial looking signs that everybody yeah. has. And that's just a concern that should be part sure. of Sure. And uh, I mean, <coughs> I was not alluding that we should, you should. No, I understand that. You know, it's just, a, it's just, it's just examples yeah, of just what's worked in other places. Oh. Just a question. Um, that lovely, gorgeous lady. Um, <laughs> um, so I would just say, speaking to Barbara's point about the younger generation, um, and also just people in general coming to Woodstock, I would say a huge point of this, and we're kind of alluding to it, is aesthetics. Um, it has to be, I would say, on a point of aesthetics, it has to be something that's somewhat fresh but alludes to the historical nature of the community. It has to be something that's consistent um, and that goes for the spaces that we create. I think the point about having a palette is really important. Um, I think that that's something that we should work on and could pr is a little bit of a low-hanging fruit that could um, that could uh, illustrate, you know, f it could help um, influence f uh, future development um, and, and it would k kind of really be important for us um, and, and a lot of future projects. Can, can um, you elaborate on that as to why you feel that's so important? The palette? Yeah. Um, just because I think that, like I said, aesthetics is really important for people who are visiting, people who live here, for them to feel like there's a sense of like economic development, that it's a vibrant town and that it looks pretty and that, you know, that's what, one of the reasons why people, the biggest reason I think why people come to visit here is that it's pretty. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think having the signage uh, reflect that uh, that asset of the of the area is is important. Um, so, uh, so yeah. So, I I think a palette would, like I said, be really um, really something to focus on moving forward with this project and having it be something that not, isn't necessarily done by committee because. And a lot of the conferences, some of the conferences that I've been to and, and just with experience, design by committee can be a huge problem <coughs> and end up with something that you don't like at all. So I would be, that's a point of weariness of saying, if that's something that we prioritize, then we should, we should do it in a very specific, intentional way and not have it be something that everybody is a part of because I think it gets really muddy and it can end up with something that we don't want in, in the end, so. Yes, Did you do a study on the signs? There's a lot of talk about signs. It seems like there's a lot of signs already. Did you figure out that, did you research or interview people and figure out that we need more signs or? 
Um, that was her during the public outreach <coughs> piece that um, in terms of pedestrian wayfinding is lacking within the town or with the village and also connections to the outside pieces. For example, I've been to Billings Farm. I never knew that Woodstock was right next to it unless I looked at a map. You know, how are those connections lacking for those who are not familiar with the area? Not necessarily tourists from everywhere, but just normal Vermonters, you know, in terms of orientation. But in terms of looking at the signage that exists within the town or the village area, it's mainly um, vehicular signage that exists um, or it's state mandated signage because you have so many state roads coming at a juncture essentially. But aside from that, there really isn't any wayfinding within mm -hmm. Woodstock except for this small sign to the welcome center with the bike route sign with the parking sign all kind of mishmashed together and and then there's this smaller sign on on the mechanic street um, wall that we were talking about other than that there's no signage for pedestrians within woodstock at all i think i think um i think you're right i i, I agree with you to a certain extent uh, there is a lot of signs already up but I, a lot of that is mandated, it's, it's required. The trick, I think, is to educate people without them realizing they're being educated. You know, it's the solitaries and, you know, the, the ways to get into their brain. Or well, Billings Farms is right up the road, you can walk it. It's a great place. Or you know, doing a great job it's down at the East End. You should take South Woodstock. It's a beautiful spot. You know, it's not, it's not, it's not within this realm. It's a great spot. People should know they can take it right down there. Can I speak um, to that for just a second? <coughs> yes. Okay. Um, there was a moment some years ago when Woodstock eliminated, and I promise I won't be long, <laughs> when Woodstock eliminated signage from the end of Route 106 that stated that South Woodstock was that away. Yeah. Uh, the inn in South Woodstock that year had a 30% drop in walk in traffic. Yeah and has suffered from that ever since. The traffic on Route 106 is, was greatly affected by that. And at some point in this process, I think that might be addressed. We'll let that one happen. So Joe, uh, we're very good as a community at planning and yeah. studying things. Yeah. Yeah. We like to study things ad nauseum. We're very good about putting up barriers and friction and, and, and looking at uh, the trees instead of the forest. This is kind of a forest project, big picture project. So I'm most amused when we get hung up on things like, you know, on that street, should we have a little cap on the thing? You know, this is about a systematic change. So my question to you is, great, what's the next step? Let's, let's, let's implement, let's, let's go. What are we doing? To kind of inform you folks to understand what goes next. Uh, I didn't want you to leave saying, oh, that was a nice idea. Wasn't that fun? Then walk out the door. Uh, I feel that our subcommittee has pretty much um, completed stage one, and that is to hire these great people to give us some ideas and pull it together and give us some kind of a direction and um, some kind of you know, way forward, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and herd these ideas into a, a common plan. That is done. Now, I think, is, okay, how do we make it happen? Now, that's our job now. And we've sp we spoke about this, uh, Ray, Beth, and I, and, and we're gonna ab absolutely take input from everybody else. The question is money. Where are we gonna get the money? How are we gonna pay for this stuff? Great writing. My, my sense is, and <coughs> one of the things that I've suggested and we've talked about is uh, the, the the uh, phrase low-hanging fruit was mentioned earlier. I think probably we'll go after that low-hanging fruit first, like signage, like benches, like trash cans, um, and bump outs, flower pots, and stuff like that, that, that we can address immediately and give the, the community a sense of visualization of what something is actually happening, point one. And then while we're doing that, during that process, go after the big ticket items and, and, and search out these grants that can, um, can allow us to do the big ticket items, sidewalks, for example, and lighting. Yes, sir. Have we had or looked to start any conversations with VTrans on the repaving? Uh, yeah. and no, no, no. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We have. 
we, have, we have started conversations with BTRANS and um, it gives us a timetable of how we might want to approach this because BTRANS will be doing their work in 2012. So if you think about the ideas... 2021. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> 2021. So we have 2019 and 2020 to try out some of these ideas by painting the roads, by putting these temporary um, things in and make decisions. So, but... 2021, the road will be paved. Nobody's going to touch the curbs after that for a couple of years. So no. we have we have a we have a nice squash deadline that will make That's us right. do things. Right. And I'd say your deadline is really this yeah. year yeah. This because year, this, they yeah, will start. <coughs> yeah. yeah, they yeah. will right. start um, okay. solidifying um, as soon as next year. And in fact, they indicated yeah. that some things are in place and not to be. You have to push. Harder. You push harder. Okay. They've already Thank done you. their just, survey work, but it can be modified. So still. just to clarify, Joe, yeah. the context of this discussion going on is happening in the context of this small committee, which anyone can join, or within the EDC, or who, who's taking the next, having the next uh, Well, I, I think what will happen is that uh, the subcommittee will petition the EDC for some money to uh, address some of this. Quote unquote, low hanging fruit. So, if people are interested, they should come to committee meetings. Yes. It will be advertised. You know, I wish you would. Seven o'clock, first Thursday of the month. I mean, we've got a great commission. Everybody's approachable. So, it's the EDC. You can learn a lot. You can EDC. give suggestions. You can give ideas. I, you know, I wish everybody would come. Yes, Ben. I'm sorry? I think she meant your subcommittee. Well, oh, I don't know what well, I'm asking. Wh which meeting are people supposed to go to if they want to participate? And that is uh, that's a real question. Is it an EDC meeting or yeah, is it a EDC separate EDC subcommittee? Meeting? Because at every EDC meeting, we report uh, okay. all the progress okay. and what's going on and take suggestions and ideas from uh, anybody present. Great. Beth has something to say, Joe. I, I just wanted to say that I think the next step for us is to hear what people have said yeah. tonight and prioritize yeah some of the, the things that might be able to get done quickly that are visible, uh, maybe with some support of the EDC or the community in general. <laughs> and um, we have been meeting um, semi-regularly and we don't want to expand the committee to 25 people, um, but I'm sure that some input would be welcome um, in going forward and I do encourage people to come to the next come EDC to come to an EDC meeting yeah. give us your input and the subcommittee absolutely will hear you and, and try to implement as much as possible first Thursday 7pm Thursday, Thursday here here 7 p.m. Month. right up here yes sir okay. one of the things that I've discovered being in Woodstock is we find things we discover things we, we try things all the time and we research as the young gentleman said before the problem I find is who's going to decide what's the finish thing going to be? Uh, I've been through several things where things have been done and then thrown out and they start all over again. Mm -hmm. Who's going to be the determining factor of the look, the feel, okay, think, the palette? Yeah. Uh, you know, there, that's, exactly. you know, and think, you're not going to please everybody and right. is everyone going to be okay with that? I think the process is going to be is that we as a subcommittee is going to listen to everybody and develop options and suggestions, and then they, it's up to these guys. The select board. The, well, the, 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 trustees, the trustees for one thing, because it's going to involve the village, and secondly, the select board, because they're the ones going to pay the bills. There's a lot of talented, creative people in this town. Really yeah. here. That's what? There's a lot of creative, ta talented, creative people oh, from, from every aspect, from fine art sure. to, to graphic design to everything. Okay. Uh, it, will you be looking to bring some of those people into your group so that you know we, we, we have educated, creative people looking at we the would options? We'll entertain anybody who can be productive and useful, okay. but they have to come to a meeting and let us know who they are, what their ideas are, and how to go about it. Well, I was wondering, were you seeking that, or, what, or whether? Oh, I, I mean, it's hard to say to somebody, I want you to volunteer for this. That's on the paper. Beverly McKay would like to speak. That's my question, is if they don't know yeah. that you're looking for that. Oh, sure. Be a good thing to put that That's word a good out. idea. <laughs> we happen to have in this town a thing called design review and development review. Yeah. We were frankly surprised that we were not informed before or had any of this come before us. Nothing is happening.
but oftentimes people come to us for review before they do construction. We have people sitting here that have done that. So I would certainly hope that you would use, utilize the design review group, and some of us do have background in some of these things. I think we need a lot of people working on this, economic, et cetera, but we do need to be consulted. And we do have a gentleman here who has been involved with some of the uh, trash cans and trees, trees and seating and so forth. So we need, we, don't work, we need funds is what you need first. Okay. Thank you. Chicken and egg. So, so I just want to make sure that the substantive discussion about what you are going to prioritize will happen in your subcommittee <coughs> to then bring to the EDC. Mm -hmm. So it might be good to just let people know when your subcommittee meeting is when you schedule it uh, so that people can come. We can okay. do that. That would be great. So that you might be just. Well, what we'll cover you is we'll, we'll discuss this and then at the next EDC meeting we will. Uh, announce for lack of a better uh what we're doing and when and where we're going to meet and people can absolutely join us that's perfect and that's next thursday next thursday yeah. and Two. can that be posted on the edc page of the website so we we i think we one thing that I think one thing that we've just figured out is we really don't need any more subcommittees of a subcommittee yeah. because we have design review, we have village review, we have the selectmen, we have the trustees that are all been put in place to represent the public and I'm sure with all of those people we can find a way to represent them because too many cooks definitely spoil the pot. We are going to end up just kicking ourselves around and never get anything done. So show up to meetings. That's the number one thing is please, if you want your voice heard, show up to meetings. Thank you all for coming tonight. Or reach out to individuals. I mean, such a small town. Just send an email to Joe. You know, I mean, he's just a human being. He's already going to